All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Dan Kirkendall. I'm the uh, co CEO and CTO of NT Objectives. Uh, we do web app scanning at a product, NTO Spider. Uh, I generally lead a lot of the security research and, and design and development of our technology. Uh, I do some blogging over at uh, Man vs. Web App, do blogging and podcasting there, and uh, we have another podcast, the InfoSec Place podcast. So I spend a lot of my time in the weeds uh, of getting uh, our tool designed and kind of looking at what, what I think is interesting in, in web security, and, and this is going to kind of roll over into mobile security. It's a Seahawks shirt. I, I don't think there's any uh, explanation needed. Actually, I'm going to be covering some um, uh, a couple example hacks, and one of them is around fantasy football. So uh, I had to wear my uh, football shirt. It's actually for any of you that follow football. Uh, I guess not this last weekend, but the fall, the previous weekend, uh, the 49ers and, and Seattle played, and I normally root for the 49ers. So I had my I had my Seahawks shirt underneath my 49ers shirt, and I was at a party, and um, and right at that last throw and got knocked back um, and intercepted, I walked around the corner all fuming, and everybody's like, oh, Dan's ticked. And then I come back around the corner, and I had my Seahawks shirt on, and everybody's like, what the? <laughs> so I like football. I, don't, you know, I like the, the 49ers, but I like football. So it doesn't really matter. It's all fun as long as it's a good game. Okay, so we're going to go through uh, some mobile hacking 101. I come at this a little differently, and I'll get to that pretty quickly. And then we're going to talk about what the seven deadly sins are and kind of discuss some example hacks and, and kind of the thoughts behind all this. So the very beginning. Uh, most of the time when you're dealing with mobile hacking, you're going to be hearing a lot of discussions around the mobile apps themselves, um, you know, what they're doing, the sandboxing, all of that sort of thing. I don't think that's as fantastically interesting. Uh, certainly there's some good stuff there. But what I try to do is get people to look beyond just the app and the device in your hand. Because generally, these apps are turning around and talking to some sort of web service to get information and to send information and receive information. To me, that's where the real value is, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, I'm going to kind of walk you through learning how to get in there, start looking at that traffic, uh, what it looks like, understanding the mobile session management, and kind of breaking all that down. So the first part is getting at the traffic, okay? You gotta get in there and see what's happening on these mobile apps, how they're communicating with their back ends. Uh, one of the best devices I've seen and the best tools for this is the uh, Wi-Fi Pineapple. That's this little device here, which I'm gonna be giving this one away at the end of the talk. So uh, at some point, give me a business card and at the end I'll give one of these, I'll give this one away. The uh, Pineapple's like 100 bucks, 120 bucks. Fantastic little device, makes it very easy to become man in the middle. Uh, what I end up doing, all right, is setting this up with my laptop. I've got a little uh, mobile hotspot. It's a little smaller than my phone. Uh, this one's uh, from T-Mobile there. And uh, it's as easy as taking your, you know, giving your laptop an internet connection and taking your Wi-Fi pineapple and sticking that out there and uh, setting it up to broadcast as well-known access points. You know, ATT Wi-Fi is good, Linksys, Netgear, whatever. Things that people are likely, you know, Hilton Honors, you know, go on. Uh, nice thing with the Pineapple is it's very good at going out there, just, it's very portable, it's very, very small. I could take this, take this, I'm a very portable setup here, okay? And uh, what I'll notice is I'll go to public areas, and uh, lots of devices start connecting to me. And I'll provide real internet access, but I'll be running like Burt Proxy and, and Wireshark or whatever, and I'll be recording all the traffic, okay? I can start seeing it. Um, so it's really easy. I just, some Linux scripts to uh, do port forwarding. You can look that up uh, or grab, grab the slides at the end if you want. But it's very easy to just do quick uh, port forwarding, all the port 80 and 443 traffic through my laptop. Um, so this will be me at the, the mall, okay? So I'll go to the mall, I'll sit there in a very public area, usually the food court, so I can snack. And um, I can just start watching devices connecting to me and start monitoring their traffic. I see all kinds of very interesting stuff. Um, I did check with legal, by the way, and uh, since I'm providing internet access, apparently it's okay. 
Uh, so anyway, like I said, be giving this away. So when you start looking at the traffic, you have to understand what you're seeing. Okay, it looks a little different than some of the stuff we're used to with web security. You know, with normal web web apps, we have the standard you know get requests, post requests, with the name equal value pair structures for sending and receiving data, right? Or sending the data, receiving its HTML or whatever it wants to be. Uh, but that's not what we're used to doing, and we're used to taking that and turning it into cross-site scripting attacks or SQL injection attacks or whatever. Very standard. There's lots of scripts out there and utilities for dealing with that. When you start uh, doing SQL injection, and I'll let this play here for a minute. Uh, is it going to play? I guess not. Um, anyway, is it going to play? Nope. All right. Well, standard SQL injection we've all seen, so we're, we're going to skip this one. Uh, but when you're starting to deal with these web apps or these mobile backends that are powering the the web the, the web services that are powering the mobile apps, you're starting to deal with a lot of new formats. You still will see the classic name equal value pair, but you're going to see things like JSON, RESTful interfaces. Um, I've seen some AMF coming out of mobile apps. That's a little more rare, but you happen. Uh, I start seeing all these things that really break up how we're used to looking at the data. So we're going to kind of break these down. The most popular, the most widely used that I've seen is JSON. Uh, JSON was initially designed for use with JavaScript. And uh, it's kind of a compressed, it does the same thing that XML does in that it lets you have nested data structures, uh, but it's, it's cleaner, it's leaner. Um, you know, they refer to it as the fat free alternative to XML for a reason. Uh, it's a very handy format, and it is easily the most widely used in mobile app development. JSON allows you to have kind of nested structures. This, is, this top one here is formatted nicely so you could see. It's like XML, you can nest data. Okay, you can have lists and lists. Uh, usually it's going to be sent as one long string like this on the bottom, uh, but it's, it's easy to understand when you start tearing it apart and looking at it. I can see it sent over a lot of areas as well. Sometimes it'll be sent as a get parameter, sometimes it'll see as the post data. Um, you'll see it ends up mixing and matching all over the place, but uh, you just got to get comfortable with JSON. It's not that, that difficult, but it's very worth getting used to. Uh, I hope this one will play. Let me see. Yeah, okay. So here's a uh, version of my little bookstore app. The, the previous one actually had a, uh, a video too, and it was just standard name equal value pair structure and sending a SQL injection attack. But uh, this one is JSON. If we look at the traffic here in Burp, uh, I could see really quickly that it's a, uh, a JSON string being sent or, you know, JSON traffic. Uh, the thing is, at some point, this is ultimately going to be turned into input for the developer. And they're going to take these values and use them, often in SQL statements. And so it's very easy to go in here and you know, create attack variations. So I could take this JSON payload, and this is the first one I just did, you know, equals five, and uh, it's sending the one product. Okay, no big deal. Uh, it's a JSON response, by the way, you see. So then I'll do a little simple SQL injection attack, a single quote and uh, send it, and all of a sudden I'm getting an error response, uh, and there's a SQL error, and it's patching up in, in JSON as well. The attacks still work. Uh, the attacks that we're all comfortable with and used to using, they all still work. It's just a different format. So let's go to the next one here. Uh, REST. REST is kind of not a really a, a format per se. It's more of a standard of, uh, or a style of, of sending and packaging data. Uh, it could be XML. Uh, JSON fits as a uh, RESTful format. Um, you can have uh, CSV responses, you know, like a tab delimited. I see all kinds of formats. Um, you know, things like RSS, Atom, those are all RESTful formats. Those are things that can be used programmably very and, and read and looked at and understood very easily. Uh, sometimes you'll see RESTful URL structures where you've got the parameters embedded in the URL. That's common. Um, sometimes I'll see the name equal value pairs. I'll see XML or XML being sent. Uh, the responses can be very mixed, so I can get back XML. I may get back a CSV. Uh, I, may get, I may send a classic uh, name equal value pairs and get JSON back. It's quite a mix. It doesn't really matter ultimately because at some point this is data that you should be able to look at and understand or find a parser for. 
um, you know, this was actually Google Web Toolkit sends. Uh, it's actually value pipe, value pipe. It's very compressed. It doesn't have the name equal value type of thing. Uh, but it usually sends back a JSON response. So there's lots of formats. Uh, but really what I want you to be comfortable with is the idea that this doesn't really matter. These are all pretty easy to deal with. Uh, still very attackable. This is a uh, version of the bookstore where it's got uh, XML-based REST interface. Um, so let this thing run here for a second. So here we go. We can look at the traffic. Uh, it's sending XML documents back and forth, right? Uh, so we'll go ahead and send this off to repeater. All right, yeah, ID equals 5, ID equals 7. All right, let's see if it'll go through. So same sort of thing here. I'm going to go ahead and plug in uh, a standard request. It's going to be sending over the one book in an XML format. Uh, I'll go ahead and put a payload in there, just uh, add a little or 1 equals 1. What should I get is basically every record in the in the database. And sure enough, I'm getting a big, huge piece of content. And it's, you know, an XML document with every record in the table. So it's still very attackable. The same exact things fall into play. Uh, same thing when we get into AMF. AMS, uh, AMF is the Adobe, Adobe, Adobe messaging format or Acro... Uh, or what's the other one? Action script messaging format. It's a little bit different in that it's a binary form. I don't see as much of this, but if you're dealing with Flash and Flex apps, uh, that's where you'll see some AMF traffic. Uh, the thing is, there are parsers for just about any language out there uh, to break this stuff down. What you'll usually see is a, a web page with like a Swift file being loaded, and then you'll see the AMF traffic, and it'll look very binary. So this maybe is a little bit more intimidating. But there are parsers for this, and uh, Burp Suite actually supports AMF natively. Uh, it doesn't always packaging up, package up the AMF correctly, but whatever, it still works. Um, so I can take this in Burp and actually see the the values, right? It's a, basically an object with data values. I can see that there's still values there. They can still be modified and attacked. Uh, so this is an AMF version of the app. And I have a mobile version of the same app uh, with the use of the REST interfaces. Uh, but same bookstore, it's sending AMF traffic. Um, and the, the point here is that this is all still very attackable. All of these different formats, and you're going to see the same thing with, web, with mobile as we get into those. Uh, so here we go. Here's the AMF traffic. Uh, it's a little harder to understand. Uh, but uh, the AMF decoder will go ahead and get it. And there you go. There's value of three there. Uh, and it'll show the other ones. Same sort of thing. It's all very attackable here. Okay, you can still go in and plug your attacks in, uh, but you just got to get comfortable with the format. So, what format is this? JSON, right? Very easy. Uh, JSON again is very popular, so you get to be friends with it very easily. So, let's look. A look let's look at a little bit of traffic. I was messing with this uh, fantasy football app. So anybody know what fantasy football is? A few nods of heads. All right, it is not uh, scantily clad women playing football. It is not aliens playing football. It is basically a situation where uh, you get together with, you know, a few other people that are going to own teams, and uh, you pick players from all over the league. It doesn't really matter what team they're on. You just fill in your roster positions, and, uh, and then based on how well they do during the game, you get points for that. And if you have more points than the other team that you're playing against on a given week, you win for the week. Um, it is basically Dungeons and Dragons for football geeks, okay? Uh, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, you just kind of you start off the season by going through and having a draft and picking players, and uh, kind of cycle through that. And then each week you pick the best players that you have. Uh, sometimes there's players that are going to be off for a week, which they call bye weeks. Um, there's going to be players that get injured. So you're kind of cycling in and out. Sometimes they're playing a team that's really tough. Whatever. You kind of adjust your roster every, se every week. And uh, at the end of the week, a winner is declared. Uh, so that's how it basically goes. So I wanted to hack this uh, because I was tired of making excuses right, on why I was losing. Um, you know, and, and I wanted to kind of be uh, back on the side of winning and trash talking a little bit more. So I started looking at the app. And the web app itself was fairly, fairly secure. I was looking through it. I was breaking down the traffic. I was trying all sorts of things. It was fine, even, even if it was built by Yahoo. 
Um, so I started looking at the mobile app. And the mobile app allowed you to do all the same stuff. So I started looking at the traffic. How is the mobile app communicating with the Yahoo servers? And so I started breaking this down. And I started looking at the requests. And this kind of scared me a little when I was looking at this. I said, wait a minute. OK, there's all this cookie stuff up there. It's got session management going on. Uh, and then I got here, Q equals update fantasy sports internal. You may not be able to read that. But that looks like a SQL statement. right? Uh, it's basically sending a SQL statement directly from the app to its server. Uh, I also started looking at the, uh, there's this green area. It says set mbody equals, and then there's this green area where path team equals whatever. Uh, so that's my team ID. Uh, but I started looking at that green area, and I looked, I spread it out, and it's just an XML document, which has a list of my roster. So it has these player IDs, and then what positions I have them in, and these ones on the bottom are BN for bench. Those are the guys I have on my bench. So I started looking at that and thinking, wow, that looks pretty easy to manipulate. Uh, but I still needed to learn a few more things, like how could I use this to mess with other people? Uh, because those roster positions, if they ever got changed, I'd be in trouble. Um, so anyway, I wanted to figure out what might be possible. I did start looking at the SQL statement itself and trying to attack the SQL statement directly, you know, just simple SQL injection. Um, I was not having a lot of luck with that. Apparently, it's something called YSQL. Uh, that's proprietary to them, and, and I couldn't really do anything. They have some other protections. Um, but I still wanted to figure out other ways. So I started looking at some of the other research I've been doing around mobile, and uh, this is where we lead into the seven deadly sins. So what this is is kind of a breakdown of how mobile apps authenticate and validate the user and the data. Uh, and what I found is there are these seven basic problems. The first one is that they trust the clients. And I'm going to go through each one in detail here. Uh, there's a lack of uh, encryption being required. They allow sessions to last a very long time. They don't keep secrets. They allow repeat requests. Uh, there's no curfew on these requests. And they fail to prevent altered requests. So let's break each of these down here. First one is they often trust the client. Uh, we all know that that's the, uh, you know, the primary sin. Developers uh, often think, and especially mobile developers, they're not, um, they haven't always learned from our past in web security. Um, but this is where it usually starts. Uh, and this could be just trusting the client and the data. Sometimes they trust the client to save data on, on its drives. Um, and there's some issues there, and we'll break those down. Um, all right, so the number two here is uh, failing to require encryption. It's kind of scary, but uh, when you start looking at traffic, uh, you don't need to really do any SSL stripping or anything. A lot of mobile apps just send the traffic in plain text. So when I'm sitting man in the middle, I can see it all. I can grab session tokens, and now I'm them. Uh, most mobile apps, and the, some of the ones that do use SSL, they don't do it right, and they turn off the cert verification. So even the burps, you know, if I'm using burp proxy in the middle, the burp SSL cert will work just fine. So uh, I'm seeing more and more apps starting to harden themselves. Some of them are even going to the level of you know, doing SSL chaining and things like that, which is great. But uh, there's still a lot of uh, weaknesses there. The next thing is la lifetime sessions. A lot of these mobile apps uh, rarely ever ask for a password. Okay? There's a lot of reasons for that. A lot of times these you know, users' expectation is they click on the little app button and it's supposed to launch and do what it's supposed to do. Uh, and users don't like entering passwords, and the form factor of a mobile device is terrible for entering passwords, so that kind of, you know, uh, that all is, works against us having a better security model. Uh, there's still things that they can do, uh, but I also see apps using some of the worst possible things to validate the user. I see some of them using the EMI, the IMEI, basically the SIM card ID as a way to authenticate the device. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Uh, anyway, this is a problem. If, you're la if you let that session last a lifetime, any point it's stolen, from then on out, they're susceptible to, to being, having a session takeover. All right, the next is not keeping secrets. Um, you know, with browsers, we have cookies. And that's really about all we've got. 
Uh, you know, we can give them a session cookie, and that's that's about all we have. Browsers don't give us storage, um, and let's not talk about HTML5 yet. Uh, but you know, our classic problem is that we we really can't store a lot of data, so we really just end up having to rely on a session cookie. Well, mobile apps don't have that limitation, but they impose it on themselves. A lot of mobile apps simply just give you a session token of sorts, and they don't do anything else. They don't keep anything secret on the device. Um, for signing requests and all that stuff later. So this is just silly uh, that they don't do this. And we'll get into some examples of how they could benefit from doing this. Most of the mobile apps also don't block repeat requests. So I was doing a uh, talk very similar to this one at RSA uh, B-Sides last year. And um, I was doing a live hacking demo, so I actually had my pineapple up and running and everything, and of course it got crashed pretty quickly, but before then I was able to see some traffic. And one of the things I saw was some t Twitter traffic. Okay, So I was able to see the, this Twitter traffic. It wasn't encrypted. It wasn't over SSL. And um, so I was like, well, that's cool. I can see this guy sending tweets. I can see him sending his direct messages. Right. So now I'm actually seeing direct messages, which are supposed to be private. And I saw that I could actually just start resending. I could put, put into Burp Repeater and kept resending it. And I can monitor that person's uh, direct messages for a while. But that's cool. Um, now, I was able to look at some of the ability to resend the tweet. And it had some, some there was a bunch of stuff in there, a lot of data. I didn't break it all down initially. But I saw that I could resend a tweet. That was cool. So I was just, I mean, it was kind of annoying to the person I was doing as I was just sending a repeat tweet. Um, but I tried altering the request and that didn't work. But it le at least let me resend the same request over and over again, monitoring direct messages, sending the same tweet. With Twitter, that's annoying. Uh, with a banking app, you know, let's say it's a wire transfer and I can resend that wire transfer, that's a little bit more of a problem. You need mechanisms to prevent somebody from taking a request that they've captured via man in the middle and resending it and having it work. Uh, one of the simple solutions for this is the nonce. Just have a one-time use token, keep track of them. If that nonce doesn't change, then uh, you know that uh, it's, it's a repeat. So you can just ignore it. Um, and then the server would just keep track and, and that works out. Now, of course, Twitter was, you know, I talked to the guy, the security guy at Twitter, and he was saying, yeah, I can't keep that many nonces. We have too big of a database with too much traffic. So I get that. So there's other mitigation steps, and we'll get into those too. Um, the next thing is allowing, uh, allowing these requests to live a long time. One of the things that I've seen is some of these requests, I could be a man in the middle, grab the request, and let's say I don't let it go to the server. I take it and I take it home with me, right? And maybe their app sees that it had a fail, fail, failed response, so it resends it or whatever. Uh, fine. But I take that one and I have it now at home. I can send it later whenever I want. Um, and what I don't see a lot of apps doing is time stamping the request and saying, hey, this has got sent out at a period of time and limiting it. Maybe say limit to only being valid for an hour. There's reasons that you want to have extra time. You know, mobile devices lose connection. We go into an elevator, we're in the parking lot. You know, we're out here on the beach where we've got a bad signal. Uh, so there's reasons that the request needs to be sent. But after an hour, if the app doesn't get a response, it should have to repackage up a new request and a new timestamp and everything. Uh, this would reduce the amount of time a bad guy would have to really play with this and figure out something to, you know, something interesting to do. Uh, again, if this is a uh, banking app and I grab that request and I stop that bank transfer for ha from happening and I send it later, that becomes kind of fun again, right? So we could put timestamps on there and enforce the timestamp. The next step here, and this is kind of tying it all together, is failing to prevent altered requests. So when I took that Twitter request, I tried changing the tweet, right, and put something funny in there, and uh, it, nothing happened, right? It, it, it rejected the request. So they were doing something to sign the, the request. That's very good. Uh, you know, when I'm looking at even putting a nonce in there, I don't want the attacker to be able to just simply change the nonce, right? I need to do something to sign these requests. And this goes back to what we was talking about earlier of having some kind of secret data uh, secret key on the device, right? So you log in and you kind of maybe do a public private key sharing. You could even do a shared secret for all I care. If you have something that allows the server to validate a request from a client, then it becomes very powerful because I can kind of take all of this data. 
I can take the user content that I want to send. I can take the nonce, uh, timestamp, take all of that and hash it together, um, sign it with my secret key, and now I've got a hash that I can include in the request. Uh, so when it gets sent out, it's going to be signed. And the server, you know, let's say I put it all together, right? I got the uh, the date time there, I got the nonce, I got the hash, I got my content. I send that, and as long as the server can validate based on that key, let's say it's a shared secret or a PKI, uh, then the server can validate all of this. They can look at that request and make sure it only could have come from this client, right? Now, of course, if somebody took, has the phone, has access to the phone, that's a whole another level. But um, just for being man in the middle, it'd be very, very difficult to impersonate this user if you do all of this right. So there are ways to do it more securely uh, and enforce uh, authenticity of the data. So it's all possible, but not very many apps are doing it. So um, anyway, but we want to make sure we never trust the client. We want to make sure that we use encryption. Um, that makes it a lot more difficult for the attacker. Uh, we want to limit the session lifetime, even if it annoys the user. Uh, you know, using secret keys, using nonces, timestamps, and then hashing all this becomes very, very powerful. So you can do this securely. But let's go back to looking at some of the apps that haven't done this very well. Okay? So let's go back to the Yahoo Fantasy uh, football app. When I started looking at this traffic and looking at the data going on, I noticed a few things that they weren't doing. And I kind of always take every mobile app and take it against my seven checkpoints, right? And uh, I started looking as the session lasts forever. It was never, I was using that app for, I had used it for two seasons. And I don't think it had ever used, asked for me for a password except for when I first set it up. So the session lasted forever. Um, which, by the way, no longer does this. They fixed it because I told them, and so now it annoys me, but at least it's more secure. Um, they also weren't using SSL. They are now. Uh, there was no nonce. Uh, there was no secret key or signing. I don't, still don't know if they do that yet. Um, so I started looking at that and saying, okay, well, what can I do? I started looking at the traffic. Um, and what I ended up doing, uh, because I had found this out before the football season started and uh, before we had our whole draft, so um, on draft day, I got there a little early, and I set up everything, and I'm the one that provided Wi-Fi access for everybody. And um, so now I'm recording everybody's session traffic, right? On their little mobile devices. I wasn't even recording the web traffic, uh, but I recorded everything. And um, so then during the season, when the season was just getting started, I started taking a look at what I could do. I saw that I could actually post comments on the message board and start kind of like, you know, messing with people, start a little trash talking between a couple people. Uh, that was kind of fun. But then I wanted to figure out how can I screw with their lineup? I want to beat them on a given week. So I started looking at this request again, right, in this XML document. And I saw that, uh, you know, you got the positions in there. And it would be very easy to take this XML doc and swap people out, stick their best people on the bench. Uh, you know, put their bench players as their starters. Uh, and then when the week starts, uh, what is nice is once the game starts, it kind of locks everything up so they're stuck. And um, I had some people calling and freaking out, right? Um, you know, because you can imagine, you're sitting there, you think you're going to win, you've got everything lined up, and all of a sudden your studs are all sitting on the bench. It's going to freak you out. Um, but it was very interesting, kind of going through that. Of course, I did this with my church league, so I just asked forgiveness. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it was fun, right? And and I and we had the, the I had the uh, every league has a commissioner. I had the commissioner fix it, but it was kind of fun. It was interesting looking at apps this way and looking at what is possible when I start breaking these things down. I got a bunch of other examples. I still got a few minutes. Wow, this went fast. Um, so I got a bunch of other examples. It was. Um, you know, I've looked at just kind of monitoring traffic. I've done a lot of collecting of username and passwords. And when I'm sitting in man in the middle, a lot of apps just send credentials constantly. Some do have a session token, uh, but I can often see username and password sent in the clear. Uh, we've looked at lots of apps over time, looking at My Backup Pro. Uh, this is an app that is there to uh, back up your contact information in the cloud. Um, and what was interesting is my backup pro, when you open it and it launches, it asks you for a pin number or password or whatever, and you put in your, your password. But when I started looking at the traffic being sent to its server, um, that password I entered was never part of those requests. 
I started. I saw I was actually using some basic auth, and so you know, basic auth is you know, base64 encoded username colon password, right? So I take that string, I base64 decode it, and it was like my backup colon pro. Uh, it was hard coded credentials being sent to their server. It was actually using the uh, phone SIM card ID as a way of authenticating me as a user. Uh, so then I had a whole bunch of, I had already been collecting SIM card IDs for a long time. And so I just ran my database through and found all kinds of accounts. <laughs> and I could just grab their data if I wanted to. It's incredible. Uh, Address Book Pro, actually, wait, was this back? Yeah, Address Book Pro, very similar sort of thing. Again, it's something users use to store data. Uh, this one's their address book. I did them backwards. But point is, as a user, I had no clue. I had no idea. I have no understanding. You know, go to the SSL thing. When you're using a web browser, uh, you know, when I'm on a site that's using SSL, I see the little lock icon and I can kind of mouse over it and it tells me who's this signed by. Mobile apps don't have any analogous feature. There's no way for a user to know what's happening behind the scenes and if there's any security being uh, put into place whatsoever. Uh, I was using uh, Words with Friends. This is a couple years back. It's totally fixed now. And it's a real pain. I can't, uh, can't cheat at all. Well, actually, I still can a little bit. Um, with Words with Friends, you familiar with that? Right? Scrabble with your friends? Well, when I first started testing this, it was kind of cool because they actually had two separate requests when you put a word down on the board. It would do one request to go and do a dictionary lookup and see if it's a valid word. And then it would get back a response saying if it was valid or not. So of course I put a valid word in and I recorded the response and I kept that. And then I took all seven letters down, dropped them on the board, because what it would do is do the dictionary lookup, it would get back a response and then if it was good it would submit the word to the board which is a whole separate thing, just saying, you know, here's the letters and positions and it would send it. Uh, so I got the, I put all seven letters on the board and uh, got the response back, I was man in the middle of the response, put the good response, sure enough it went forward and sent the words onto the board and, um, you know, I was playing my cousin and he calls me up, he's like, that's not a word, how did you do that? No fair. So he, he kind of had a fit. But it was cool because I was like, oh, I could just cheat all I want. Um, I ended up reporting it to... Uh, Zynga and they fixed it. But what's interesting is in their new fix, they still wanted to deal with some performance issues. So in the new responses, uh, it's all one request. So one request to check the word and submit it if it's valid. Okay? If it's not valid, it'll come back with the failure. But it also includes a list of all of the valid words that would be possible. So, you know, maybe I'm not so good at Scrabble, but I thought those, I was like, oh, I didn't think of that one. So I'll go ahead and use that next time. Uh, but that was kind of cool. Um, they use SSL, so you have to SSL strip it, and it's a real pain. But, you know, if I want a good score, it works. Um, I was looking at uh, some news apps. So I've been looking at lots of apps. This, uh, this one here is uh, uh, Associated Press's mobile app. Kind of like the idea of hacking the news. So I started playing with that. I saw here count equals 10, and it was sending a JSON response back here. Um, simple SQL injection payload up there, and of course I'm getting SQL statements back, right? Getting a SQL error. There's a lot of this out there. People are building mobile apps very quickly, building web services to power them very quickly with very little validation. Um, you know, if you look at some of the big hacks that have been in the news, uh, this one's a little different. And this is the, uh, uh, the app from Starbucks. Right? Did you hear about this? So Starbucks mobile app had some problems. Um, and this is actually a little different in that uh, what I've got here is it was storing the, basically the username and password in plain text on the device. So you do need, a, you do need to get the device physically in your hand, but once you do, you can actually go and look at this file and see their username and password. Again, people use the same password lots and lots of times, so that ends up being valuable but you do need the device or an app that can break out of the sandbox and read that file. So I've been looking for malicious apps that are looking for that file. I'm sure they're going to be prop popping up. Um, this only works on the iPhone version or the iOS app. It doesn't work on the Android app. But, uh, you know, at some point there will be an app out there harvesting these credentials. Uh, they have fixed the app since then, uh, but that was nice. That was, that was a little different. At least it was something on the client side. Uh, this is another one, and I kind of think of, I might add a, like an a eighth deadly a sin. Uh, remember I was talking about repeat requests? This is kind of a variation of that. Uh, 
it's not really repeat request because it does have a nonce, although you can use the same nonce over and over, so I guess it doesn't validate the nonce. But uh, did you hear about Snapchat? They had their security problem. Uh, what it, if you didn't read the details, what it basically broke down to is in their web service, they have a thing for you to look up who you're, you know, look up a friend. And uh, you just plug in a phone number and it'll tell you if they have a Snapchat ID and it'll give back their username. So what these guys did is uh, they just wrote a little Python script that looped through a huge list of phone numbers, right? Phone numbers are only so big. There's only so many. Um, loop through and it would get back a response on anybody that had a username associated with their phone number and now you would at least know their username and phone number. Um, they weren't getting anything else beyond that at that point but it was kind of an interesting problem here uh, because it did allow a very simple brute force attack. I mean the Python script was 40 lines or something uh, and that was probably because it had comments, right? Um, but, you know, and, and actually it wasn't able to get the uh, passwords I don't think but you know, it's these web services are really going to be our next vulnerable entry point. This is really, I think, where attackers are starting to focus more and more attention uh, in the years to come. So, uh, anyway, this is a. I've only got a couple minutes. So I want to open up for questions here. But this was a. Uh, there was Pwn to Go. This was uh, that old app Bump. You remember that app? Where you bump and it would transfer contact information. Uh, same sort of thing here. It was never validating users. Uh, when you bump your phones, what would happen is it's not sending phone to phone. Both phones would go and talk to the server and say, hey, I just bumped, and here's my location, and, uh, and then it would match you up based on time. All right? Based on time and location, it would say, okay, these two people are the ones that bumped each other, so then it would swap information. Um, the weakness here was that there was no validation. It didn't really have the account on the server. It would send the vCard at the time of the bump. So what was kind of interesting, uh, and MJ Keith is the one that found this. I think he's over at uh, Denim Group now. Um, what, he, what we found on this is that it was very easy to become another player in that conversation. Uh, when I did my tests, I had been at RSA recently. I grabbed the GPS coordinates there. And so uh, what I looked at is when you bump, it asks you for your location or one of the data points you put is your location. Well, I was wondering what MJ Keith found out is there was no boundary conditions there. You could kind of give it a pretty wide range, right? Normally it would, you know, the, at the phone would say you're within, you know, 50 feet of this location or whatever. Uh, but I took mine and said I was within three miles of the Moscone, right? and uh, give me a good range. There's conferences going on all the time. So I wrote a little Perl script that just, just cycled through. I have a high-speed connection, and it just kept saying it bumped with, from the Moscone within three miles of the Moscone, right? I was standing in the Moscone with three-mile variance. Uh, and just let that run. And what I started seeing is that I would start seeing bump requests. And a lot of cases, so I multi-threaded it, so I had two of them going, and I would end up seeing... Uh, two bump requests. So let's say you know you bump you know with her on your phones, not each other. Um, so you bump phones, and uh, and I would end up getting the responses for both of you, okay? And so I would say you know I would usually what I would do is I'd get and I would return an error back. So I had a V card set up that looked like an error, and so you'd get your you'd get your response, and you'd actually get a V card from me which said error error error. So what users would do often is say oh I don't know what happened let's try it again. Okay? But I recorded each of your V cards. So now I could take the responses, and I have both of yours, so when I bump again, I'll see which one's which, and I'll go and send you the others. But I can do anything I want to those V cards. And what MJ Keith did is he took the URL and put a uh, URL that actually exploited a buffer overflow of the uh, Safari browser on the iOS that could give him remote shell. So you got a V card from her, and when you clicked on her website link, it would load a remote shell that MJ Keith could act, get access to. So, you know, there's little things like that. When you're looking at these web services, you're like, how are we validating these users and make sure that we're not doing anything that's uh, malicious there? Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there was timing and location. Um, but those aren't hard data points to, to fudge. <laughs> Oh yeah, I let mine run for months, and I was getting all kinds of stuff. And some of it, I was just collecting V cards. Sometimes I wouldn't get both of them, but every once in a while, I would get both, and they would rebump, and I would send them each other's, and I would put little 
you know, I change things. You know, sometimes I swap around birthdays and stuff like that. All right, anyway, um, that's about it. Uh, you know, in conclusion, I think mobile apps are the emerging target, but I think it's important to look beyond the device in your hand and that app itself. Um, watching traffic is very fun and easy to do. Uh, it's important to really start learning these new formats, learning how this is all taking place and starting to look at it, get comfortable with it. Um, session management is often done very, very wrong, even when people use OAuth. And OAuth is a, a nice little library and, and standard. People do it all wrong. They use pieces of it. So it'd be like, oh, we use OAuth. Well, but you're doing it all wrong. So uh, not a lot of good there. So anyway, the uh, avoid those seven deadly sins. And um, if you want a uh, pineapple, bring your card up.